So I'll go ahead and get started. Folks, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for allowing me the time to speak with you today. Um, this presentation shouldn't take us longer than about 30 minutes or so. Um, we really want to focus it on a lot of, uh, probably about three different themes uh, this morning. And, um, you know, definitely want to make it as worthwhile. So I encourage you to be as interactive as possible. And uh, every now and then I'll definitely go back to the chat box and uh, answer any questions you might have that will come up during the presentation. Uh, but to give you a little bit of background about what we do, we are an outsourced accounting solution. Uh, we provide all accounting and taxes. And um, this is a little tidbit from our marketing team. Uh, we essentially take care of your accounting and taxes uh, so you can get back to running your business. Okay, so um, definitely want to make this as worthwhile. And uh, I encourage you all to answer as much or basically ask as many questions as you'd like. Uh, a little bit of information about me. Uh, fairly new to the accounting and taxes industry. Just want to make sure everybody can uh, see my screen here. All right, perfect. Sounds good, guys. So a little bit of information about myself. Uh, I'm a finance consultant here at Indonero, and uh, fairly new to the to the uh, overall uh, accounting industry. Um, worked as a broker previously. And yeah, I actually uh, trade currencies on the side. I've been doing that for about seven years. Uh, I'm located here in the Portland office, and uh, our main office is located in uh, San Francisco. And we expanded up to Portland just last year. We also have an office in New York. Uh, we work with a lot of incubator programs. And uh, I decided to make the move up here from Dallas. And uh, I got to tell you, it's a big time food paradise for a guy like me living out here. So um, that's just a little bit of uh, some information about what I do and uh, you know, definitely want to make sure I can help you guys out today. Um, so, so here are the, some of the main things that we'll be learning today. We're going to be focusing on the two main things that all companies need for their back office, regardless of what kind of business you're in, what kind of work you do. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we cover these topics. Okay, uh, This is kind of the main theme of today's webinar presentation. All right? It's going to be based on financial reports uh, that investors and lenders require. But not only that, I also want to uh, give you all some information on how you can learn from this as well, just in running your own business. Regardless of investors and lenders, uh, we want to make sure that you guys can uh, get a full idea on how to look at your financial statements and uh, how to make uh, managerial decisions based on that information. Okay, so, and uh, once we go through that, we'll take a look at four different options for handling your accounting and taxes. All right, so I just want to launch a quick poll question here. Uh, what are you most interested in learning about today? Let's go ahead and select one of the uh, following answers. All right, all of the above, got it. So, got a few coming in here. All right, perfect. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, we'll definitely make it uh, kind of cover all those different categories. All right, perfect. Excellent. So, the two main things as far as what you need, a way to track your money, and a way to pay taxes. So as far as tracking your money, um, there's so many different ways of going about doing that. And it's not just by looking at the bank account and looking at all the information uh, in the bank account, right? There's definitely ways to track it as far as looking at expenses, looking at categories of spending, um, looking at monthly spending, looking at streams of revenue, right? Analyzing different uh, trends that happen over time. All right, so a lot, of th a lot of these things can be very helpful in running your business. And of course, a way to pay taxes. I know how much everybody loves to pay taxes, so I definitely want to cover that in greater detail as much as possible. Um, so financial reports, the key to going over this, guys, is to do it in a fashion where I'm not putting you to sleep. I want to make this as fun as possible and make sure that we can uh, kind of uh, show off some features that we have as well. Um, and regardless of uh, whether you work with us or not, to just kind of give you an idea on some of the data that you can analyze in your back office. All right, so these are the accounting must-haves, and these are some of the things that can be very beneficial to you in, uh, you know, analyzing ways to pay taxes and uh, just kind of helping you make managerial decisions. So it's going to be the P&L statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. 
All right, so these particular items um, is definitely key to giving you an, some insight into your overall business, right? Um, but the thing is, is how, are you, how do you get these reports? Well, first off, you have to have uh, an overall ledger and you have to have what's called a chart of accounts. And there's different types of information that we pull from that in order to compile these financial statements. Um, so something like this is pulled at the end of the month, right? So in order to do that, the way the process works is you have to have, uh, you have to reconcile these uh, transactions at the end of the month uh, in order to close out the books. And um, you definitely want to make sure that you have access to this information. So these are the top three financial statements. Okay. So let's talk about this. So these are the main users that are mostly interested in the financials. Okay. Creditors, tax authorities, and investors. So first off with creditors. Um, the way they do this, okay, and the reason why it's so important to them is because they have to quantify risk. Now, how do they do that? Well, they assess the liquidity of their clients, and uh, we'll get into greater detail on how they do that. So for the IRS, they are most interested in your P&L statement, right? So they want to determine the, uh, the basis of the income and expenses, and this is disclosed in the financial statement uh, that can be generated at the end of the month. And Thirdly, this is, uh, is kind of like the more uh, interesting part of the presentation, in my opinion, is going to be based on the investors, right? We want to make sure that, um, that they have the, the full knowledge and information at their disposal on how to assess the overall profitability of the company, uh, how to mitigate risk on their side, and also look at the potential return of the investment of a company that they're going to, going to invest in. So it's not just the overall business idea, but we're mostly, they're mostly going to be interested in the overall numbers perspective, right? So let's go and take a look at the uh, creditor interests in the financials. So um, they are basically going to analyze the cash flow. And the way they do this is they basically um, get an overall measurement of your current assets relative to liabilities. So this kind of gives me a good opportunity to uh, pull up our Indonero dashboard here. And the way we do this is I'm actually just going to pull a balance sheet. Okay, so this is what our dashboard looks like. Kind of give you some more information on that. And I'm going to look at the reports and analytics section. All right, so under reports and analytics, um, you can access the balance sheet at a few clicks. And uh, this is a relatively easy thing to do for us. So I'm actually just going to pull it up from last quarter. All right, and this is a test account. And this will give us some, uh, some insight and I'm just gonna go ahead and click on update and I'm gonna export that to a PDF document. Okay, so this is how we analyze the, uh, what, what's called the current ratio. All right, so you don't have to make uh, any notes of this in particular, but the overall gist of doing this is we're going to assess the current assets relative to the current liabilities. Okay, so you can see that our current assets are a little over a mil and current liabilities versus other current liabilities, we're looking at about easily about over a quarter, quarter mil, okay? So you divide those two numbers and you get a, an actual number. So the higher the ratio here, the more liquid you are, okay? A commonly acceptable current ratio is an even two. So if you think about it from that perspective, it's a very comfortable financial position for most organizations. Um, acceptable ratios vary from industry to industry. So for example, for someone like a, uh, like a tech company, right, obviously you, you would look for something a bit higher. Or uh, if it's an industrial company, 1.5-ish, or a manufacturing company, something a little bit lower than that. Depending on what stage you are in the business, um, this number can basically vary. But the overall gist here, guys, is to assess your assets relative to the liabilities. You can do that simply from a balance sheet statement, okay? So all of the things being equal, uh, a high current ratio tends to be uh, the best number here. So um, that means that you're more likely to meet your short-term liabilities, okay? These are liabilities due over the next 12 months, within the 12-month period. So how liquid are you to meet those obligations, right? From a lender's perspective, um, they want to assess the overall risk on their side just by looking at the capability for you to meet those short-term obligations. So another thing too, though, is if you are a company that holds inventories, Right, so you can basically look at what's called the quick ratio. You basically take into account your current assets less the overall inventories that you have, and you divide that by the current liabilities. Okay, so a pretty quick and easy ratio to run there. All right, so this is a pretty quick number to, to pull from that. I'm just going to see if I have any uh, questions here. 
All right, so far so good. Perfect. All right, now I'll be back to the presentation here. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is going to be the taxable uh, authority interest in the financials. So um, the way they do this is they're basically going to pull um, the, uh, the information from your P&L statement. So the way to determine uh, what amount you owe is based on the taxable income, right? So um, you can pull this from the financial statement. And I also included uh, a few snippets here. So I included the payment periods on when the date is due for that period for the payment. And then I also included a, uh, an actual chart here on the taxable income relative to the tax rate on what you owe and what you pay. Okay, so for example, let's say that I earned uh, about you know, 80,000, right? Let's say I earned 80,000 in the past quarter. So you can see here that I would essentially make a payment of 13,750 plus 34% of the amount over 75K. All right, so it's some pretty simple math to do here. It's a simple addition, multiplication, and you make that payment to the IRS based on this payment period, okay? Um, now, of course, this isn't a perfect world because there's certain items that, uh, that can be deducted, um, and there's a lot of different ways to go about paying your taxes. Um, but just in an overall sense, this is what you're looking at, right? So um, another method to do this is, is what's called the safe harbor method, okay? Um, and this is for companies that are profitable over uh, you know, the past few years. The safe harbor method basically allows you to pay 25% of what you paid for the entire year of the previous year for the first quarter of this year, okay? So 25% of what you paid last year for quarter one. That's what's called the safe harbor method. And you can look that up in greater detail and it'll kind of give you some additional insight, but that's the other method to take into account here. All right, and of course, pulling a P&L statement is a very easy process. And um, depending on who you guys use, and we're gonna you know, do a quick poll here as far as getting an idea on what you guys use to generate your financials. Um, but I'm gonna basically just pull up a P&L statement and I'm gonna go to a quarterly date range and I'm gonna look at last quarter and I'm gonna go ahead and export this over to a PDF document here. All right, so there's our P&L, and you can see our total revenue, less the cost of goods sold. We have our gross profits. And then these are the other things that we can control, right? So we can control certain items here as far as uh, you know, different expenses. Um, another thing too, is we're gonna be uh, looking closely at, um, at the cost of goods sold, because this, these are items that you can control based on how you run your business, right? How cheap can you make the items or how cheap can you obtain the items before you sell them? or the different types of services involved, right? So the very bottom here, this is gonna show us all the expenses, and then of course we have our net profit, okay? So this is the big number here. All right, so with us, uh, the way we do this is we essentially pull uh, all, of the, all of the data, and then at the end of the month, we close out the month, end, uh, the month end, and we reconcile the books, and we generate the financial statements, that's gonna be the P&L, balance sheet and statement of cash flow and you have access to this about one to two weeks after the month has ended. Okay, so you definitely wanna make sure that you have access to something like this and running your business, just to get an overall idea on uh, how the business is running. Okay, but not only that, but obviously if you make, make uh, payments to the IRS, this is gonna come in very handy. And the next thing I wanna take a look at is going to be, it's going to be the uh, investor interest in the financials. Okay, so this is kind of the more fun one, I, I should say. So. Um, the way they do this is they're going to assess the risks using a different ratio analysis. Um, so one of the more common ones that they'll use is not only the ratio of long-term liabilities to equity, but they'll look at something like uh, the overall operating efficiency, right? So they'll look at uh, your gross profit, they'll look at uh, the net profit, okay, net profit margins. Um, so right now, around this time of the year, this is a very popular time of the year for, for companies reporting the, uh, their, their earnings from the past quarters. Um, so we're now in what's called earnings season. There's a lot of different companies out there that reports the uh, net profit margins. Uh, Alcoa is one of the biggest corporations that reports it on the street. And um, you know, a lot of investors make their decisions based on 
um, this type of data. Okay, so um, I want to just quickly go over the net margins. It's a very easy number to run. You take your net profit and divide that by the overall revenue. Okay, so um, and again, the way we do this is you have to generate the uh, P&L statement and you pull the P&L statement directly from the dashboard itself or however you guys pull your statements yourselves. Um, and not only that, one of the other ones is going to be our return on assets. Okay, the return on assets. It is essentially your net income over the average total assets. Okay, now why does that matter? Why does return on assets matter as a business owner? Well, it matters because it's important for investors to see how wise you are in allocating your resources. Okay, how wise you are in allocating your resources. So. The way we do that is we essentially have to pull, we already pulled the information from the PL statement, and um, we already pulled the information from our balance sheet. So what you do is you take your net income from the past quarter and divide that by the average total assets. Okay. You take that number and you divide it by the, the uh, average total assets, and that's going to give you your return on assets. All right, so just you can definitely make note of that, return on assets, net income divided by average total assets. The higher, the better here, okay? If you meet with investors and not only are they going to look at the overall business idea, but if they can see that you're on top of your game in generating these financial statements, uh, it shows them how passionate you are on getting into the fine gritty details of the financials and pulling that information, showing them just how important that is. So. Uh, I think a lot of this can provide a lot of value when you have those meetings with your potential investors. Uh, and of course, you have to have somewhere to pull the information. So that's what we do, right? Um, and as you can probably tell, higher profit margins, the better for shareholders. Um, about 15 to 20% is typically a good net profit margin for, the, uh, for a tech company, right? That's the ideal number to be at. Obviously, if you're in startup mode, you might not be there at this very moment. Um, maybe a few years in, that's definitely a number to shoot for. Okay, so, and this is just based on the industry average, so about 15 to 20%. All right, I'm actually going to go ahead and generate another poll here and to, to determine what you use to generate your financial reports. I'm going to go over the polls here. Dun, dun. All right, we got some people using a lot of uh, their information through QuickBooks, some through Excel. Yeah, so Excel will probably, um, you know, that's something if you're doing, you're doing it manually. Uh, obviously, if you're using Excel to generate these financials, I imagine you have a pretty profound knowledge of, uh, you know, of doing different sorts of, uh, you know, spreadsheets pretty often and um, through QuickBooks. Okay, so we got a lot of people using QuickBooks. All right, well, that's definitely good to know. Um, it's always good to see exactly uh, how you guys currently do this. It's a very popular um, way to generate financial reports. And that's what we typically, that's the clients we typically work with have used QuickBooks in the past. Uh, a very common setup is they have a bookkeeper, they'll use QuickBooks, and they'll have an outside CPA. So um, that's a pretty common setup for a lot of companies that are fairly new. All right, so using QuickBooks, um, you still have to do all the work yourself. So something like that, mostly built for accountants. Um, it's not user-friendly in terms of being built for co-founders, but um, the main thing here is you guys are actually doing it, so that's good to know. Um, so remember, a lot of that information can be very helpful for investors. And um, some of the other key things here that I want to just go over is different options on how to do this, okay? So I want to go over four different options. And what makes this what makes uh, best sense for you and the ideal situation on on what option to use? Okay, so option one, doing it yourself, right? Most of the people in the room here are doing it themselves using something like QuickBooks Online. Um, the thing here is you're still doing a lot of the work yourself. Okay, you're still spending a lot of hours, uh, and what it really comes down to is how much you value your time. Um, so this makes sense for a lot of freelancers with few expenses and a pretty consistent stream of revenue. And um, it might give us limited insight into cash flow or PL. But again, if you're generating those statements, then that's okay. 
Um, obviously, if you don't have to do it yourself, that's that's perfect. But you know, if you're looking to cut costs and you're still fairly new, and you have low operating expenses, it might be the best option at this point. Now, option two, doing it on doing it on the cheap. So it takes you away from doing this, from building your business. Um, a lot of people will basically use the QuickBooks software, hire a CPA at the end of the year for taxes. Um, one thing that I want to make very clear here, and this is uh, very important, and we see this a lot of times with clients that are using QuickBooks on their own or they're using Excel spreadsheets on their own. Um, when you hire a CPA to do the end of the year taxes, the mistakes can be very expensive. And why is that? Because in the event that you make some sort of wrong adjustment in the books, maybe something from the month of January, the month of June, and the CPA basically picks up on that, he has to go back and adjust the books from that specific period of time. And they might already quote you uh, like a flat, a flat fee to file the books, or to close, to close the books and to file your taxes, whether it's 1120, 1065, any sort of uh, you know, item out there that uh, whatever form that they use to file your taxes. Um, but it can be very expensive because they might go back and charge you an extra hourly rate. Um, so it can be a little bit expensive. I mean, we've seen cases where um, there have been constant amount of mistakes because they're not accountants. You know, it, it might be a bookkeeper. Um, anybody can really do a bookkeeping type of role, but um, it, what really matters is having the industry experience. Okay, so the third option is using a traditional accountant. So something like this is good for a well-established company. Um, they already have the existing APMP set up, and that's an acronym for Account Policy and Procedure. Um, you typically want to make sure that the, the, the traditional account you hire, um, you want to make sure that they work and that they're compatible with companies like yours, right? Do they work with tech companies? Are they familiar with uh, integrations through payment processing systems, right? How do, they, how do they reconcile the books at month's end? Are they matching invoices directly to checks you receive, right? So the deliverables are highly variable. Um, the back office may not be as transparent as you need. So if you have the ongoing support through addition that's doing it for you, um, they, they basically keep the bookkeeping and the uh, tax filing in-house, and you have access to a CPA, that's great. Okay, so that's also another option. Now, this is kind of what separates a lot of companies from traditional accounting firms. They provide the software and they provide a service. Okay, so what this does is it basically gives you transparency through the reports and the ability to make adjustments on your own through a cloud-based dashboard, okay? So you, basically what this entails is having an in-house accounting team along with a outsourced accounting solution, which is a cloud-based dashboard. And this is something that we offer. This is not something where we fall under, okay? So rather than having you guys keep it in-house or doing it on your own, spending hours a day as a business owner, it's not something that investors like to see. You know, they want, they want somebody that's in, uh, that's, that, that's well experienced and well versed in accounting handling this sort of thing. So with us, obviously, this is what we provide. Okay, it's ongoing monthly support and giving you access to our cloud-based dashboard. Okay, so which option is best for you? Well, there's a lot of different variables to consider here, right? The number of employees, the monthly spend, um, I can tell you right now that a good sweet spot for Indian Narrow is anywhere between, you know, a couple employees all the way up to about 100 to 150. Um, if it's anything more than that, and let's say the monthly spend is well in the hundreds of thousands, and, um, you know, there's different types of reports that, uh, that lenders require, investors require, um, there's a lot of different variables that determines whether it's a good fit or not, okay? Uh, but with us, I can tell you that it's typically around one to 150 or so. And monthly spend for early early stage clients, you know, we're talking like clients that are still, um, you know, fairly new to the to the business, that they've only been around for a few months, maybe a couple years. Um, that typically tends to be a good fit. But obviously, we we like to screen those, and uh, we're more than happy to set up time with you to go over everything. All right. So just taking a look at our Indonero software as a service, um, we were founded in 2009. And uh, we have, I actually threw up uh, two pictures from our two co-founders. We have Jessica Maas, our CEO, Andy Sue is our CTO. And um, we provide accounting and tax services in one solution. So we handle all the bookkeeping, we handle all the tax filing, we provide ongoing support, and we also give you access to our cloud-based dashboard, okay? So we're featured in Forbes, Inc. Magazine, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, TechCrunch, Entrepreneur. 
Um, so, so these are just uh, some additional points on why it's a good fit, right? So we save time, focus all your time and energy steering your business to success, handle the things that you know best, which is your business, not necessarily the accounting, right? So with us, um, we provide ongoing support. You have a dedicated account manager supporting your team. We streamline the whole operation, okay? Um, we scale with you as you grow. That tends to be our, that's actually our market niche is we grow with companies as they scale in size. So from the, from, uh, the start, right, let's say you're a startup company, you're only spending about, you know, maybe 10 to 20,000. And as you scale in size, as you hire more employees, as you obtain more market share, we grow with you alongside. So, um, and of course, tax filing must-haves, this is uh, also our expertise. This is our area of expertise, our fast response times, even during the busy season, like right now, um, we, have, we have quick response times, even though that we are approaching uh, close to the end of the tax season. Obviously, there's a lot of extensions that people will file, but we're always on top of that. And I actually have worked with a lot of companies that, were, that are outside of the US. You know, they have a US subsidiary that's, that's located overseas. Um, and we understand a lot of tax filings, okay? Um, this is something that's very important because it can cost you thousands of dollars. It can cost you tens of thousands based on the type of uh, entity that you have set up. So this is something that we do handle, okay? And these are additional things to consider, right? Your time, your money, and of course, expert advice. So with that being said, I really want to open it up to some Q&A and uh, kind of cover anything that we didn't go over in the presentation.